Picture this, a dimly lit room, a vintage television set flickering with anticipation, and you perched on the edge of your seat. The year is 1958, and you've just stumbled upon a cinematic gem that would leave an indelible mark on your memory. How to make a monster. It's the kind of movie that lingers in the corners of your mind, sparking nostalgia with every recollection. As the black and white images danced across the screen, you were transported into a world where monsters came to life, not through CGI wizardry, but through the sheer brilliance of practical effects and storytelling. The plot, a sinister tale of a Hollywood makeup artist turning into a real-life monster, kept you spellbound, your imagination running wild. Perhaps it was the eerie makeup transformations, the suspenseful moments that had you on the edge of your seat, or the nostalgia of a bygone era of cinema that etched how to make a monster into your cinematic scrapbook. Whatever it was, you knew this movie was more than just celluloid. It was a piece of your personal history. Now, let's delve into some intriguing random facts about this iconic film, peeling back the layers of its creation and legacy. Get ready to uncover the hidden gems that make How to Make a Monster a timeless classic that still haunts our hearts and minds today. So, dim the lights, and let's journey back in time to the golden age of horror cinema. The character Pete Dumond in the 1958 movie How to Make a Monster may have found inspiration from real-life makeup artist Jack P. Pierce. Pierce had a notable career at Universal Studios, spanning 20 years, during which he left his indelible mark on classic horror films like Frankenstein, The Mummy, and The Wolfman. However, his tenure at Universal ended abruptly when he was fired, marking the end of an era in Hollywood's makeup history. The movie was advertised with the enticing tagline, see the ghastly ghouls in flaming color. Yet, contrary to this promise, most of the film was in black and white. Only the final two reels graced the screen with the vibrant hues of color. This marketing twist left many viewers surprised when they realized that the majority of the movie was devoid of the promised color spectacle. Adding a touch of entertainment to the film, on stage performer John Ashley appeared as himself, showcasing dancing girls. Ashley, known for his appearances in numerous 50 seconds through 80 seconds TV shows, later ventured into television production, leaving an indelible mark on the entertainment industry. Additionally, he lent his voice to the opening narration of all five seasons of the A Team series, becoming a familiar voice to television viewers. In conclusion, How to Make a Monster offers not only a glimpse into the world of Hollywood makeup, but also a curious mix of marketing strategies and memorable guest appearances that have left their mark on the history of cinema. The 1958 movie How to Make a Monster is often associated with American international pictures due to its content and style. However, it wasn't filmed at an AIP studio. Instead, it was shot at Ziv Studios. There wasn't a dedicated studio for American international pictures during that time. One interesting pop culture connection to this film is that a few clips and even the title of How to Make a Monster are featured in the music video for the song The Number of the Beast by Iron Maiden, released in 1982. This inclusion in a famous music video has helped keep the film's memory alive. In the movie, the character Jeff Clayton, portrayed by Paul Maxwell, drives a 1958 Lincoln Continental convertible. This car adds a touch of classic elegance to the film's visual appeal. While How to Make a Monster may not be as well known as some other films from the same era, its unique connections to American international pictures, its cameo in a popular music video, and the classic car featured in the movie make it an intriguing piece of cinematic history. And that's a brief look at the 1958 movie How to Make a Monster and its interesting connections. Stay tuned for more cinematic insights. In the 1958 movie How to Make a Monster, there's a notable body count of five. This horror film, directed by Herbert L. Strock, features a storyline where a makeup artist seeks revenge on those who want to replace him with newer, more realistic monster masks. Interestingly, hanging on the wall of Pete's home in the movie are the heads of several monster creations by Paul Blaisdell. These creatures originally appeared in other films like It Conquered the World, Invasion of the Saucer Men, and The She-Creature. This subtle detail adds an intriguing connection to the broader world of 1950s monster movies. Additionally, Gary Conway reprised his role as the monster from I Was a Teenage Frankenstein and How to Make a Monster, offering fans of the earlier film a familiar face 
and a link to the larger monster movie universe. In conclusion, How to Make a Monster is a film that not only delivers scares, but also ties together various elements of the 1950s monster movie genre. With a body count of five, the inclusion of Paul Blaisdell's monster heads, and the return of Gary Conway as a familiar monster, it remains an interesting piece of cinematic history for horror enthusiasts. Samuel Z. Arkoff, the producer of the 1958 movie How to Make a Monster, had a specific actor in mind for the lead role, Bella Lugosi. Lugosi had been a significant influence on Arkoff for years. Unfortunately, Arkoff's wish couldn't come true because Bella Lugosi had passed away in 1956. How to Make a Monster was released by American International Pictures as part of a double bill with another film called Teenage Caveman. This was a common practice in the film industry during that time, where two movies were shown together as a package deal for moviegoers. Interestingly, in How to Make a Monster, the character of the projectionist was played by the movie's producer himself, Herman Cohen. This dual role added a unique twist to the film and showcased Cohen's versatility in the industry. In summary, How to Make a Monster is a 1958 film produced by Samuel Z. Arkoff, originally intended to feature Bela Lugosi in the lead role. It was released alongside Teenage Caveman and featured producer Herman Cohen in the role of the projectionist. In the 1958 movie How to Make a Monster, a peculiar twist unfolded behind the scenes. American International Pictures, the production company, not only created the film but also portrayed itself as a major studio within the movie's storyline. However, here's the twist. AIP wasn't a big studio, it rented space in small lots for its productions. The movie suggests that Pete, a character in the film, worked at AIP for 25 years, implying that the studio had been around since 1933. But the reality is quite different. AIP was founded just four years before How to Make a Monster was shot. This creative narrative choice added an intriguing layer of fiction to the film, blurring the lines between reality and make-believe. Additionally, the film strategically promoted another upcoming project. In one scene, visitors to the studio are informed that they will be taken to the set of horrors of the Black Museum, which was slated for release in 1959. This served as an advanced plug for IP's next production, written by Herman Cohen, building anticipation among viewers for what was to come. Lastly, the New York premiere of How to Make a Monster took place at the Brooklyn Paramount on July 27, 1960. It was featured as part of a double bill, paired with the film Why Must I Die? This premiere marked a significant moment in the movie's history, as it continued to captivate audiences beyond its initial release. In conclusion, How to Make a Monster not only entertained audiences with its horror storyline, but also played with the idea of a studio's history, and cleverly promoted its own future productions. These unique aspects make it a memorable piece of cinematic history. The Unseen Struggles, How to Make a Monster's cast member's journey to overcome depression in the midst of fame in the glitzy world of Hollywood, where the spotlight shines bright. There are often stories hidden in the shadows. One such tale revolves around a cast member of the 1958 movie How to Make a Monster. Behind the scenes, away from the cameras, this actor battled a silent demon, depression. While the world applauded their on-screen talent, behind closed doors, they grappled with a relentless darkness. The pressures of fame and success weighed heavily on their shoulders, but they chose to confront their inner demons head-on. Seeking help and support, they embarked on a journey to overcome depression. In a town where appearances are everything, their decision to address their mental health challenges was both courageous and groundbreaking. They shattered the stigma surrounding mental health issues in Hollywood, paving the way for others to follow suit. Maintaining a career amidst depression is no easy feat. It requires immense strength and resilience. This cast member's story is a reminder that even in the glitzy world of fame, struggles are often unseen, but they can be overcome with determination and support. Their journey serves as an inspiration for those facing similar battles, reminding us that seeking help is a sign of strength, not weakness. In the midst of fame, they found the courage to address their mental health, and in doing so, they became a beacon of hope for others. This is a story of triumph over adversity, of resilience in the face of fame, and of the unbreakable human spirit. In the end, it's a reminder that no matter how bright the spotlight, we are all human, and we all have our struggles to overcome. 
The curse of legends, unsolved mysteries of tragic events surrounding how to make a monster's cast member. And the mysterious curse of Hollywood in 1958. A movie how to make a monster sent shockwaves through Hollywood. Not just for its chilling horror plot, but for the mysterious curse that seemed to follow some of its cast members. While there's no concrete evidence linking the film to the curse, the tragedies that befell some of those involved have left the entertainment industry in shock and disbelief. One of the most prominent figures touched by this alleged curse was Robert H. Harris, a talented character actor who played the role of Pete Dumond in the film. Harris had a promising career ahead of him, but tragically, his life took a dark turn. In 1978, he was found dead under suspicious circumstances, with the cause of death remaining unresolved. Some speculate that the curse of how to make a monster played a role in his untimely demise. Another cast member who fell victim to the curse was makeup artist Jack Dusick. Known for his exceptional skills, Dusick crafted the iconic monster makeup for the film. However, his life took a tragic turn when he mysteriously disappeared in the late 1960s, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions. Despite extensive investigations, his fate remains unknown, adding to the eerie aura surrounding the movie. While it's essential to approach such stories with skepticism, the string of misfortunes that plagued somehow to make a monster cast members is undeniably unsettling. Whether the curse is real or just a series of unfortunate coincidences, it remains one of Hollywood's enduring mysteries, leaving us to ponder the dark and enigmatic side of the silver screen. In the world of cinema, where reality and fantasy often blur, the curse of how to make a monster stands is a haunting reminder that some stories refuse to fade into obscurity, no matter how hard we try to forget them. As we bid adieu to the celluloid world of 1,958 seconds how to make a monster, we find ourselves standing at the crossroads of nostalgia and imagination. This cinematic gem, a tapestry woven with threads of horror and ingenuity, has left an indelible mark on the annals of cinema history. As you reflect upon the flickering images, I invite you to delve into the recesses of your own cinematic journey. Perhaps you were ensnared by the eerie makeup effects, masterfully crafted for the silver screen. Or maybe it was the spine-tingling storyline that captured your imagination. Did you, like so many others, find yourself pondering the blurred lines between artistry and madness, as the film's protagonist brought his monstrous creations to life? Or, perchance, you reveled in the way this movie transported you back to a time when B-movie magic was at its zenith, embracing the peculiar charm that only vintage horror cinema can conjure. Whatever it is that lured you into the world of how to make a monster, your connection to it is a thread in the rich tapestry of cinematic history. So, I invite you to share your thoughts, your cherished memories, or even your personal revelations about this cinematic masterpiece. Let your voice be heard in the echoing chambers of film nostalgia, for your perspective is a vital brushstroke in the canvas of film appreciation. Thank you for taking this journey with us, for your time and your enduring interest in the magic of cinema. And remember, the story continues, shaped by each one of us as we carry these cinematic treasures forward. Until our paths cross again, keep the reels of your memories spinning.